2006 was declared as one of the hottest years on record, starting the trend, at least in my way of thinking, of hearing about the hottest year on record. We've heard a number of those years that have ticked by as, as being classified as that, as I would think you would agree. And since that time, since that time, just seven years ago, our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the amount of carbon dioxide in particular in our Earth's atmosphere, has climbed from what was 382 parts per million to now just over 400 parts per million. And if that isn't enough, the projections are with business as usual, in another couple decades, we could be at 450 parts per million. And I don't know what this planet would be like with that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, it makes me cringe to think about it. But it's possible, uh, and I think we're on that way. Well, we're here tonight to learn more about that. I am not the special guest or the expert, as I said. Uh, and I trust that you will find tonight's presentation uh, both fascinating, I think you'll learn a lot, I think you'll be engaged, and it will be provocative. Um, and we will have a, a lively conversation after, after Blake finishes with his, with his slides. Now let me introduce you to Blake Davis, who, can, uh, who is the special guest for this evening. Uh, Blake is a professor, an adjunct professor at the Institute of, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology and holds a master and bachelor's, uh, bachelor degree in city and regional planning and uh, has an expertise in urban agriculture and energy efficient structures. How many of you have been to the plant in Chicago's Back of the Yards neighborhood? Raise your hands. Yeah, it's a great place. And, and Blake's students are the ones that designed the aquaponics facility at the plant. And I also will give you a little tip. If you haven't been there yet, go on Saturday when Blake's leading the tour. It is awesome. I would go again. I've been there twice. I'm going to go again. So I got to know Blake through working with him in Chicago Bioneers, and it was apparent that we shared values and, and visions for the future. But I kind of wondered what his students thought of him. Did you ever kind of wonder that too? <laughs> so I looked it up, and here's what they had to say. They said, some of them, Professor Davis is a wonderful guy with a great sense of humor, one of the best I've ever had at IIT. And here's one even better. Professor Blake pretty much rules. He rules. His positive can-do spirit is indeed infectious. And for that reason, I can think of no one I'd rather spend my evening with talking about climate change than Blake Davis. Please welcome Blake. Uh, I guess I am the speaker then. Uh, my name is Blake Davis. Uh, I teach in industrial technology and management at Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, what I'm going to tell you tonight are my own views, not necessarily shared by Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, and I would uh, like to thank uh, the uh, Great Lakes Pioneers, uh, the Wellington Avenue um, UCC Church, um, and also the Eco-Justice Collaborative for inviting me here to talk to you. Um, I, uh, I'm going to tell you uh, the way I see the world, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask you if, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a refutation for what I'm saying, I'd love to hear it. I've been doing this for about a year, uh, and I've been waiting for somebody to say, oh, you're really wrong about this and this and this, and therefore your conclusions aren't correct. Uh, Pam, if we could have the first slide. <laughs> so, um, so uh, gross domestic product, or, or uh, uh, some similar version of that, is something you hear about every day. And it's always pitched as if it's higher, uh, things are much better. Um, and I want to first do a definition and say that really gross domestic product is the rate at which we're converting the natural environment into man-made products. And since our paradigm is to make things as quickly as we can and throw them away as quickly as we can, uh, it basically leads to a loss of the natural environment. 
The other thing is that for politicians, for businesses, it's probably the most important single uh, metric that they have to determine whether the country is better, whether their business is better, and whether we're happier. Uh, so, please. <laughs> so, we are coming up to some serious uh, restrictions in the amount of energy, in the amount of materials, in the type of things that we can get, we can buy, we can extract from the ground. Um, right now, something as common as iron ore um, has a projected life of about 15 years. So all of the iron ore that we know that's in an economically obtainable quantities will be gone in less than 15 years. Um, so we're not just talking about rare earth metals or something where this is, you know, some exotic thing that we may or may not use in ordinary life. We're talking about something as common as iron ore, as common as copper wire. Uh, so next please. So the sustainability trends. Okay, so uh, last October we passed seven billion people. Uh, it is almost certain that we will pass eight billion, even under the most optimistic projections, uh, before we start going back down. Uh, it's unlikely that we will see the population that we have on the earth at this very moment. It's unlikely that we will be back to this number of people any time within about the next 50 years. Uh, many of the people that are uh, in the world are rapidly uh, trying to become Americans, therefore they have more income, uh, which allows them to use more resources. Uh, and finally, uh, we, have, um, we have this idea of carrying capacity. How many people can you have on the earth? And it depends always on the resources. How much food is there? Um, you know, and in our case, how much energy is there? Uh, because we have essentially won the lottery three times, uh, we discovered that coal wasn't just this black rock that you could kick around on the sidewalk, you could actually make power out of it. We discovered that you could actually take that oily stuff that came out of the ground in some places and burn that and make cars run. So we won the lottery twice, and really uh, most of us are hoping that somehow we're going to win the lottery a third time and find some other rock or some other oily stuff that will somehow power the society that we have now. And uh, I'm here to tell you that um, there's, always, uh, there's always wishing that, that's a, you know, hoping is a good thing, never lose hope. But uh, if I was a, a betting person, I would say let's uh, bet on not winning the lottery the third time and try to do something different with it. Next, please. Okay, so to, uh, to avoid facing the fact that we're going to run out of energy, we're going to run out of a lot of materials for all practical purposes, uh, we tell ourselves some stories. Uh, so the stories that we tell ourselves make us feel better and they keep us from acting. And so I want to talk about what those stories are. Uh, so the first story is that, okay, so, so this is a serious problem, but it's somewhere far in the future. Okay, so it's, it's a problem that my grandchildren are going to face or my great-grandchildren. It's not my problem. Okay, so it's something down the road that we'll deal with when we have to. Uh, the second thing we tell ourselves is that, okay, so we're dumping all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but if we uh, decide to stop, we can just stop. And then we can reverse the process and things will go back to the way they were. Next, please. Uh, so then um, another thing we tell ourselves is that there are very smart people working on this. So they're working for the energy companies, they're working for the university, and they're going to find a way to do this without us having to change our lifestyle. Okay, so talking about something as draconian as actually like not driving one day a week, uh, let's not talk about that because after all, really things are getting better. I mean, almost all the world signed the Kyoto Protocol which said they're gonna reduce their amount of carbon dioxide levels to 1990. 
So we're making progress, right? And then finally, there's a, um, what can I do about it? Okay, so unless all the governments of the world, unless all the business organizations get together and agree on how to do this, uh, it's not gonna happen. And so there's nothing I can particularly do about it. So I'm gonna just get along as best I can because there's nothing I can do because all the governments of the world can't get together to do it. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> most of these narratives are wrong, although they have some, uh, some elements of truth to them. Uh, the first one is that uh, it's our children's problem. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the environmental science doesn't back that up. Uh, what we see is that uh, most of the projections made for what's going to happen as a result of climate change and how quickly it's going to happen are embodied in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Quadrennial Report. And the last one uh, said, for instance, that it is unlikely that the polar cap, uh, the North Pole, will melt uh, any time within the next 50 years. And then in 2006, uh, you could have swum to the North Pole, but you could not have walked to the North Pole because there was no ice. Um, all of the glaciers are melting. Uh, that wasn't supposed to happen for another 20, 25 years. Uh, so everything that's supposed to happen sometime far in the future keeps putting, getting closer and closer to our own time. Uh, so the other thing that we have done is that we, uh, originally government said uh, 450 is the number. So it's not dangerous until we get to 450. And then subsequent science said, well, okay, actually it's 350. And as, as Pam told you, we're already at 400. So uh, so we're far past, we far exceeded the safe amount of carbon dioxide. We, uh, we say that we, uh, we will be able to, um, to change our ways uh, because this is something that's going to happen slowly and incrementally. So uh, every day we get up, we do the same things, our days are pretty much the same. We go to bed, we go and do it the next day. So, so our experience of life is that everything happens the same, and if it changes, it changes very slowly. Uh, but in fact, that's not necessarily what happened. So this is just an example. Uh, there were 11 million accidents in 2010, which is the last year I had data for. Um, 32,000 people were killed. None of those people got up in the morning saying, uh, you know, this is going to be a really bad day. I know it's going to be. So, so things don't always happen incrementally, slowly. Sometimes they happen suddenly and disincrementally. Next, please. This is a graph of the, what used to be called the Grand Banks, which is the very productive fishery in the North Atlantic. Uh, it, we used to get cod from there. Uh, this is the sort of tonnage of cod that people caught over various years. And as you can see, up until about 1960, uh, we just kind of went a little bit above, a little bit below, and there was always enough cod. Uh, around 1960, we started to develop really uh, good fishing gear, and there were a lot more boats with that fishing gear on. So all of a sudden, we were able to get a lot more fish out of the, out of the Grand Banks. And so about 1980, we peaked. We had peak fish, as it was. Uh, and then all of a sudden, we had the same great gear. We had the same number of boats. But all of a sudden, there weren't any fish. The fish dropped down. So that in 1980, everybody got scared and said, OK, let's stop fishing. This is getting very scary. We're going to lose all of our fish. And so you see what happened. The fish went up to their historic levels. And then they said, OK, let's go. Game's on again. And it dropped off until 1995. There was no fish. There were no fish. There were the same number of boats. There was the same great gear. There just weren't any fish. And so nobody's fishing there now, but it still hasn't recovered. So, so this, this is a way that things can happen in the environment. You can actually kill the golden goose. So, so this is likely to be what we'll see with a lot of things in the future. Yes. 
Okay, another thing that we say is that uh, there's all these international uh, agencies, uh, all these governments, um, we're having to wait for them to get together to do something. And the problem with this is that that's probably not gonna happen. There's only actually one example uh, of international agreements that was with ozone. Uh, it does happen to be working relatively well, but it's the only one that was actually engineered. As you can see, when people got together in Stockholm, they just agreed to disagree. They could not come to any more, uh, any, any better agreement than what they did in Kyoto, which was, you know, 10 years before that or something. Um, the other thing is that uh, everybody, in the absence of some binding international agreement, which I consider unlikely, is going to try to solve the problem in their own way, in a unilateral way. So they're gonna turn it into a zero-sum game. Uh, so I'm gonna try to, try to solve the problem. You're gonna try to solve the problem in a different way. This other country is not gonna agree that it's even a problem. We're all gonna do it our own way and it's gonna become a zero-sum game. So anything, any energy that I save, somebody else will say, oh great, here's an opportunity that I'll use it instead. Uh, the other thing is I think that the governments are going to decide that this is an energy problem. It's not an environmental problem. It's not a problem of strategic materials. And I think those are all connected. So it's not one of those problems. It's all of those problems together. So if you imagine that we were going to be completely renewable and we were gonna get all of our renewable energy from wind, think about how much steel it would take to put up all those towers, uh, how much resin from petrochemicals it would take to make all those fiberglass blades. Um, and if you think about that, um, this is not an insignificant amount of material. So if you decide it's an energy problem, then you're gonna have to take those resources from someplace else and devote them towards energy. And what I think is we're gonna see these giant mega projects that the governments are going to sponsor or they're going to fund, uh, and that's what's going to be the solution. And if we do fracking, we're gonna get a lot more gas out of the ground and we're gonna burn that, and that's gonna just make it that easier to get to that 450 parts per million of CO2. Okay, so uh, we say that we, uh, we are ultimately masters of our fate, uh, which means that the problem is only our problem, but the problem is really with the natural environment. And if you keep heating the natural environment, what you do is you start to release uh, naturally held sources of carbon dioxide. So right now we're putting down the street, we're throwing a one pound bag of CO2 out of the window every mile we go down the road. Uh, so we think it's our problem, but uh, what happens when you heat the, the ice up what's under the ice, something darker than the ice itself. So the ice is actually serving a beneficial function by reflecting light back out into the atmosphere. If you melt the ice at the polar caps, if you melt the ice on the glaciers, then what you have is a darker something that absorbs heat and will keep reheating the atmosphere. Uh, when you start heating permafrost, what you're doing is you're taking stuff that was permanently frozen but it's organic stuff. And when you heat it up enough, it defrosts, and once it defrosts, it starts to decay, and that will release CO2 into the environment. So you get these sort of positive feedback loops that when you make things hotter, they start releasing tremendous amounts of CO2 from the natural environment. So it's not something you can control, and I think the number is about 450 parts per million, that's what people are saying. Okay, so energy efficiency is the way to go, right? Well, it's, it's obviously the thing that industry's working on, it's the thing that the government's working on. Unfortunately, when you increase energy efficiency, that tends to cause you to use more energy. So this is called Jevons Paradox. Uh, and essentially, uh, the United States is using half the amount of energy to create 
uh, a unit of gross domestic product as it did in 1970. But we're also using 25% more energy than we were in 1970. So although we're much more efficient, we're also using significantly more energy. Uh, the other thing is that uh, um, the IAEA estimates that by 2035, we will need about twice as much energy because of not only the developed economies, but particularly the developing economies like China and India. Uh, even if you produce that energy with relatively clean, uh, uh, like natural gas, it still means you're putting more CO2 into the atmosphere. So if we double the amount of energy, we may put two-thirds as much CO2 in, but it means that if you're projecting that much more energy, you're also projecting that much more increased CO2. Uh, okay, so, so we've signed, we didn't sign, but everybody else in the world signed the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol said we're using less energy. So obviously, even though we're not a party to that agreement, we must be using less energy worldwide because everybody else signed it, right? Well, in fact, the Kyoto Protocol said we're going back to uh, 1990. That's the, that's the year. Uh, we are actually using, uh, since the Kyoto Protocol, uh, we're actually using uh, about 30% more energy and compared to the reference year, which was 1990, we're actually using, we're, we're using 45% more energy and producing 45% more CO2. So in fact, uh, if you look at sort of the worst case scenario, that's what we're doing. So even though we said we're going to be better, we all promised, solemnly promised each other we were gonna do better, we're not doing better. We're releasing more CO2, we're using more energy. Uh, next, please. So this is the second graph and the last graph that I'm gonna show you. Uh, but essentially, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change said we're going to uh, project uh, some scenarios. Uh, one of the scenarios would be business as usual. That's the A1, F1, which is at the top, the top line. Uh, the dark black line is our actual usage. So you can see that uh, 2008, something funny happened. Our uh, energy uh, went down, we stopped producing so much CO2, uh, but things got better and now we're almost back on schedule to use as much energy and release as much CO2 as the worst case scenario considered in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, so we're, we're not doing better. I, this, this may be cold water to you, but we're not doing better, we're doing worse, please. Uh, okay, so, so what, what, what is the summary of what will happen when climate change occurs, okay? Um, so uh, all of the glaciers are almost melted now, so that's land-based, all the glaciers are melted. Uh, the uh, North Pole uh, is actually an ice flow. Uh, that has already melted in 2006. Uh, it gets closer to melting completely every year. That's probably the next thing that will go. Uh, on land, in our climate here in the Chicago area, Midwest, it means uh, wetter, but also drier. So big droughts, big floods. So more extreme weather events. Uh, I would imagine that at least some of you are here because uh, you know something is wrong, you just can't put your finger on it. So uh, about six years ago, um, there was a tornado that knocked down my mother-in-law's house, and I went and helped her fix it up, but the tornado just kind of went between several houses. Uh, I'm listening to these uh, tornadoes in Oklahoma, and they're a mile wide. I mean, this, this is a tremendous jump in the amount of energy that's in tornadoes. You know, the twister that took Dorothy up, if it was a mile wide, she'd have been obliterated before she even got to Oz. Uh, so the other thing is that we're going to, 
actually have trouble feeding people because the grain growing areas in the Midwest uh, will be drier. If you saw what happened to corn last summer, uh, there's two things that happened. One is that it was drier, and so it was difficult to give the corn enough, uh, enough water. The other thing was that uh, because the climate is changing, the dates when plants naturally, you know, are releasing pollen, when bees are showing up to spread the pollen, those are starting to differ from the traditional times. So the problem was not only was there not enough water for the corn to grow, but also the pollen didn't come at the right time. It, come, it came when it was too dry already uh, for it to be of much use. So people just plowed the corn back in the ground. Okay, so we are not prepared. Well, some people are prepared. <laughs> Next. So if you, uh, if you get a whole bunch of non-political or at least non-partisan uh, smart people together and you say, okay, to avoid this, what do we need to do in terms of how much CO2 we're releasing? Uh, generally, they will come up with what's called a climate action plan. And actually, the city of Chicago has a climate action plan uh, that says we are going to reduce the amount of CO2 that we re release into the atmosphere uh, by 80% by 2035. And, and there's a bunch of climate action plans and it's 2035 to 2050, but essentially they all say the same thing. Uh, we need to use about 80% less fossil fuel to be able to reduce the amount of CO2 that we release into the atmosphere. And so to do that, we have to re re reduce the amount of uh, fossil fuel we use if we uh, were, go ahead, if we were to take all of that uh, energy that we saved and we were just to distribute it between the developing economies of China and India, uh, we would actually increase, we would almost double their per capita use of energy. So China and India per capita use only about a tenth of the energy that we use in the United States. So we would distribute it to many more people. There's two, two, two billion, five hundred million people compared to our three hundred million. Uh, so there's ten times more people. Uh, next, if we took all of that energy that we saved and we gave it to, go ahead. I don't think that changed. This would bring China and India up to the level of Bhutan, Uzbekistan, uh, Serbia, <clears throat> I don't think they're going to be willing to stop. So that means even if we did a heroic job of saving all of the energy that we possibly could, we changed our lifestyles, we electrified our cars, uh, we did all of this, and the energy, which is fungible, which means it can go anywhere, went to India and China, it would not significantly improve their standard of living. So what this means is that everybody in the world would like to have a standard of living like the developing countries, like the developed countries. And to do that, they're going to use way more energy than there's any way for us possibly to supply. So next. So, if we're going to inevitably have less energy, it means we're going to have a decline in our lifestyle unless we do like sober people and put something aside for the future. Um, and so, I think that we're in an age of resource abundance. I think in the future, we're going to have very tight uh, resource supplies. And we need to put something away now that we can carry forward into the future so that we have something when there are no resources available. So there's two parts to what I'm going to tell you that I think that you might want to consider doing. One is there's a personal survival plan. So what do you do? What does your family do? There's also a community survival plan. 
Okay, so, so I'm not a survivalist. I'm not gonna tell you to get guns and put food away uh, because I don't really think that that's gonna be a society if everybody does that. I think we need to have a community response as well. But I'm gonna tell you the personal survival plan first because that's something you can actually do yourself. Okay, so what are, the, what, are the, what are the major problems that we have, okay? One thing is that our investments are in the wrong places. I think we're living in the wrong places and we don't have the knowledge or skills that we will need to survive and be successful in the future. So those are the three meta problems, next. So when I say our wealth is invested in the wrong places, uh, if I told you uh, what's your retirement account, 99% of the people are going to say I'm in a mutual fund or whatever, whatever. Uh, so the reason I say that your resources are in the wrong place is because uh, what is a stock or a bond or an ETF or any of those financial instruments? They're an IOU from the economic system that sometime in the future you can get some money for this, you can get some value for this. Um, what's gonna happen though is that um, the, environmental, the environmental collapse is going to come after the economic collapse. So, so the environment has three billion years of being stressed and having resources to avoid being stressed uh, the modern economic system is at the most 500 years old, and I think it will collapse from the environmental stress before the environment does. So it's the canary in the coal mine. Next. Uh, we're living in the wrong places. Okay, so if you're living in an apartment in Chicago, you're probably in the best place that you can live. But most of the people are living in the suburbs, or they're living in rural areas. Uh, if you're living in the suburbs, you're living in sort of the highest energy requirement place you can live. Um, it's very difficult to, to get any place or to do anything without your own personal transportation. Uh, and finally, we, uh, we uh, have very poorly built houses. So if you have a Chicago brick building that's in a block with other brick buildings, you probably have a house that's already survived 100 years. Uh, many of the houses in the suburbs uh, were built you know, 30 years ago and they're probably at the end of their economic life right now because basically their life was determined by how long the mortgage was and the mortgage was 30 years. <laughs> um, so demographics are important. So, uh, so everybody knows there's baby boomers and there's everybody else. You all heard that, right? Uh, so uh, the reason demographics are important is because um, who has most of the resources now? Well, demographically, people who are older, they have pensions, they've had jobs for a long time. Most of the income is actually with older people. Older people have been told you have to save, you have to invest because you're gonna need the money when you get old. Because when you get old, you get sick, you know, you have all these other expenses, you'll be eaten up by inflation. Um, so they have saved and they have invested. And so when they get sick, uh, you know, when they have these stresses of being old, what are they gonna do? They're going to liquidate their assets. And when they liquidate their assets, who's gonna be there to buy them? That everybody else who's not doing very well and doesn't have very much money. So I think that that's another reason that it's, your assets are gonna be worth less in the future is because you have to have somebody to sell them to. And unless you're selling your house or your assets uh, to somebody who's doing better than you are, so if you can get a Chinese family to buy your house, then maybe that would be a, a way to get your money out. But essentially there's not gonna be as much money available uh, because the money's in the hands of the people who are gonna be selling. Um, so the other thing is, the third thing is that we, we don't have the resources uh, in terms of our own personal skills and knowledge. Uh, so if you don't have McDonald's cooking for you, 
uh, can you cook for yourself? If you don't have Monsanto and Cargill supplying you with all the ingredients to cook, do you have a source of food? Do you know anything about how to take care of yourself medically? You know, do you know how to get from one place to the other if you had to? Can you walk? Can you hike? Can you bicycle? Um, we don't have most of the skills that we need to do the basic things that we need to do. Next. So, uh, what are the things that you really need? So if you look at survival manuals, not survivalist manuals, survival manuals, uh, they, there's a rule of threes. You need oxygen within three minutes. Uh, you need food, uh, you need, uh, sorry, a warm place within three hours. You need water within three days. And you need food within three weeks. Otherwise, you're pretty much dead. <laughs> uh, so we have, a, we have a little bit of problem that we, uh, we, particularly because of advertising, have a little bit of trouble separating what we need from what we want. So when my children come to me and they say they want something, that's not what they say. They say, I need something. And that, I think, permeates our whole society is that we haven't made that clear. These are the things that you really need. You need water, you need shelter, you need fuel, you need sanitation you need medical equipment. These are the things that you need to be able to support yourself with. Most of these things are provided by centralized uh, expert systems right now. Uh, if those systems cease to function, even temporarily, uh, most people pretty much have no backup. So when the tree knocks down your power line, uh, what happens? All of the food in your refrigerator and freezer goes bad if it's more than a couple of hours because most people don't have any backup system for, for any of that. Next. Uh, so what's really valuable? Okay, so some land, food, water, support of your community. These are things that are actually of some value, and these are the kind of things that we should be developing for the future. So when I say I'd rather have these things or access to these things than an IOU from Chase saying we'll pay you on this bond in 30 years. This is, this is actually, this could actually keep you alive. Okay, so, so I sort of, I'm polishing off my crystal ball um, and I'm making some um, projections, totally my projections, um, and I've divided the world into sort of what happens in the next 50 years. So uh, I would say the short term is less than 10 years. Uh, what you're going to see is that it will be increasingly difficult uh, for people to uh, operate as if things were on this sort of, you know, inclined path. It's going to be very difficult for most people to keep their same standard of living. Um, also, the government, I think, will start many new sustainability, read energy projects uh, to try to keep the whole thing going as is uh, because, you know, God forbid we don't want to have to change even the least little bit of thing. The American way of life is our birthright. And finally, I think what you're going to see is that uh, there was a turning point, the recession of 2008, and we've been waiting now for how long? 2013, we're waiting for the normal business cycle to return. And the economy is strengthening, but I think what you're going to see is that uh, this is just the beginning of a long decline. And so, so don't live your life assuming that everything is going to be fine soon, because the normal business cycle no longer applies. Yes. Okay, so short-term actions. Uh, get out of debt, because debt is something that can hold over you. If you have debt on your house, you can see what happened with all the foreclosures that happened. Uh, that could happen again. Uh, get healthy. I mean, most of us know, really, that most of our problems are self-created. We eat too much. We don't exercise enough. Um, also, try to get some land. Community garden plot, wherever. 
uh, to start practicing skills that may be critical in the future. Can you grow your own food? That's important to know. If you're living in the suburbs, I think you might want to consider moving into the city. Uh, my rationale for saying that is that cities, uh, at least by the research that's been done, uh, actually use less energy per capita. So, so cities are more energy efficient uh, than suburbs. So on a per capita basis, the cities will be more efficient in using energy. You'll have more uh, options because you'll have public transit. You'll have a lot of things in the city. Uh, but remember, this isn't forever. This is the short-term uh, issue here. Uh, get efficient cars, uh, make your housing more energy efficient. The price of energy is going to keep going up. This will all repay you many times in the future. Uh, and also I would suggest, uh, even if you have one really good job, uh, thinking about diversifying. So take a second job so that if the economy does tank in some significant way, you're not solely dependent on one source of revenue. Uh, you should learn all the things you can about the basic things you need, food, shelter, um, water, uh, all of those things. Uh, you need to take um, the stuff that you have, especially stuff that you're paying to store somewhere, and turn that into actual resources that you can use now to prepare for the future. Uh, and begin learning the skills that you'll need and also join up with other people who are doing the same. So there's a, there's a, uh, a transition towns is an idea that came out of England, uh, figuring out how to manage the decline in energy. Uh, and part of that is reskilling. And reskilling means, okay, so uh, you couldn't make an aspirin, you couldn't sew a shirt, you couldn't make a pair of shoes. Uh, you are naked in the world if you have to depend on your own resources. Nobody should be that dependent on the system that they live in. You need to be more self-reliant than that. Uh, okay, so then there's the midterm, and I would say that's sometime between 10 years and 30 years. And so hopefully by now you're living in the city, uh, you're using public transportation because it's prohibitively expensive to drive, uh, and you will, uh, you will be looking at uh, a new, uh, people are going to have come to grips with the idea that things aren't going to get better sooner. And so now what they're doing is they're coping with reality the way it is. Uh, and I think a lot of the big projects that the government's going to propose, that's going to fund fracking, you know, we're going to go try to dig all the coal we possibly can out. Uh, all of those things will eventually fall short of allowing us to continue the lifestyle that we've gotten used to without interruption. And people are going to come to grips with that. Um, I think that you will find that, that, that things, commodities, the things that everybody expects to have just stumbling over in their house are going to be in short supply. Everything's going to be in short supply. And at the end of the 30 years, uh, even though the cities are more efficient and offer more opportunities, at some point there won't be enough energy to keep the cities running and then you'll have to think about doing something else. So at some point even the cities run, run low on energy and even though they're working more efficiently, they can't continue to work. Uh, so what are your midterm projects? Okay. Uh, look for a place to live. Look for people that you want to live with. Uh, we've done some studies at IIT over a long period of time, and if you live a vegetarian lifestyle, you can live on one quarter acre per person. So, so there's about four acres in the block, so that means uh, four of you on the block can live, the rest of the people are <laughs> out of luck. So uh, since, that's, uh, since that's hard to do in the city, it may mean that you need to look for some other place where you can find more land. Uh, you also need to utilize the skills that you've been practicing for the first 10 years. Uh, things are gonna need to be repaired, things are gonna need to be rebuilt, people are gonna need food, they're gonna need water, they're gonna need 
They're gonna need services. Those services probably aren't gonna be coming from China for a lot of different reasons. Those things are gonna be, have to be supplied locally. And if you want to thrive in the future, you have some of those skills that somebody is willing to pay for or, or barter for with you. Uh, and then finally, uh, a lot of people are interested in permaculture. Uh, permaculture is instead of having an annual planting of food and other crops, that you actually plant permanent things, trees that produce nuts, fruits, uh, so that you have to do less work. So you can actually provide for more people with less work. Um, you should have a source for water. Uh, you should be looking at animals for, uh, for things that you can use animals for. Um, so let me go back to, to a conclusion that I reached in doing some research. And that was that the last time the world was uh, sustainable was around the early 1800s. And the reason was because that was just before the steam engine came into wide usage. And so what are the sources of power in a sustainable uh, universe? It's people, it's animals, and it's wood for heat. Those are the only sources of energy that you have. Uh, so unless you want to be doing all the backbreaking work, uh, you, you don't have too many choices. You have trees that you can burn and you can have animals that can do heavy work. Uh, you also need to d be skilled at medical self-help. If you look at a modern hospital, if you didn't have rubber gloves for every operation and you didn't have uh, one-time use medical supplies, the whole system would fall down because nobody knows how to run a hospital right now that doesn't require basically throwing away tons of material every day. Uh, you need to, to get certain critical materials like seeds, uh, phosphates. Uh, you need to find sources of power, renewable power for yourself. And you need to look out for your security. And once again, this isn't you know, a whole bunch of guns, this is a community response to make sure that everybody in the community is secure. Next. Okay, then the long-term prognosis is 30 to 100 years. Uh, I say 100 years, but it really is pretty much forever because things aren't going to change. There's not enough energy to make uh, rapid and permanent change possible. So, so we, have this, uh, we have this idea that somehow we're so much smarter than our ancestors were uh, because we can drive cars whenever we want to and even you know, the King of England before 1820, uh, you know, you know, even with thousands of retinue, uh, could not go 60 miles an hour down a road. Uh, so we think we're smart, but in fact, we just have uh, access to more resources. If those resources decline, we're thrown back to where we were in 1820. The other co corollary that goes with that is that the population, which was sustainably supported in 1800, was one billion. If we're at seven or eight billion now, but we have the resources to support one billion, that sounds to me like a lot of people are going to die. I don't know that they're gonna die on the streets of Chicago, uh, but I think there's gonna be a tremendous population reduction, and I don't think it's gonna be voluntary. Uh, and finally, um, this will be pretty much uh, where you're going to be, with the exception of us terribly exceeding 450 parts per million, in, in which case the climate could change like the Dust Bowl, the climate in the Midwest could change to a desert in which case you won't be able to survive here for the most part and you will have to move further north because that's where the arable land's gonna be if we get the climate changing significantly in the future. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, you basically keep your ears open for what's happening in the world and then you uh, find a place that you can live with people and assume that this is going to be sort of uh, where you're going to live for the rest of your life and where your children and grandchildren, uh, if you're successful in making it uh, habitable, are gonna live for the rest of their life. Uh, the other thing I would say is that we don't want to lose all the technology that we have. So 
Uh, I'm not for necessarily, you know, keeping an iPod factory working, but I think it might be nice if there was an x-ray machine available if you needed one. And I don't think an x-ray machine is going to be available unless there's essentially a monastery of people that are supporting that x-ray machine. So, so if you want to keep those in your life, uh, you might have to work with other people to keep those in, in your life. Uh, so in the long haul, um, we're going to be saving as much technology as we, ha as we can. We're going to try to get as much material so that we know how to support ourselves. Um, there are still books like Farmers of 40 Centuries that tell you how people live for 4,000 years in China without any chemicals, without any petroleum. Uh, so there are people that tell you how to do it, so you need to get those. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I don't think the individual response is the complete response. I think there needs to be a community of people. Um, you know, if I go to sleep in my bunker, I'm asleep. Some, who's guarding the bunker if, if I'm asleep? So, uh, next. So I think that uh, what you need to do is that you need to uh, have a bigger community. And, and I'm gonna say that, that although I haven't heard anybody else say this, uh, if you want sustainability, you need to develop a sustainable economy. Uh, the problem with the economy that we have is that it's based on growth. Growth is built into our economy. Um, there's an important, uh, an important rule called the rule of 70. Uh, basically, if you tell me uh, what percentage of growth something is, the rule of 70 will tell you how many years it will take before you will be doubling uh, the amount that you have to do. So for instance, right now we're somewhere between 2 and 3% growth. We're just sort of at that level and that's what's barely necessary to keep our economy going. If we have less than two to three percent growth, we fall into a recession. Uh, so we need two to three percent growth every year just to kind of break even. So by the rule of 70, that means between 20 and 35 years, that means our economy will double. If our economy doubled, that means we'll be using twice as many natural resources, that means we'll be using twice as much energy, and I don't see where that's coming from. You know, I mean, you know, if there's somebody out there that's, you know, figuring out cold fusion, I'm all for it, but I, I don't see it. We're, we're not going to be able, at 2 to 3 percent, we're not going to be able to double our economy by 2035 or by 2050. And that's what everybody says we need to do to keep the lifestyle that we have right now. So that means to me that we're not gonna be able to keep the lifestyle and we better be planning for what we're gonna be doing in the future. Uh, so the, the problem is that uh, you've probably heard of the concept of peak oil. Uh, peak oil has pretty much been demonstrated in the United States. Uh, peak oil says that basically uh, there's a certain amount of good, easily available oil in the ground. You pump that out as soon as you can, and then after that, it takes more and more energy to get less and less energy out of the ground. So in the United States, uh, in 1970, we peaked. Now we've discovered oil in Alaska. We've, uh, we're, we used to be a couple miles offshore with oil drilling. We're now 300 miles offshore. Did we ever exceed that peak in 1970? No, we have not. If you apply that same rationale to the entire world, we probably peaked somewhere between 2005 and 2008, which means the amount of oil that we can pump out of the earth is limited, but there's lots and lots of people who want it. Americans, Chinese, Indians, Indonesians, Mexicans, you know, everybody in the world got the idea that if you use more energy, you get a higher standard of living. That's why the Chinese are successful. That's why the Indians are successful. It's all predicated on more energy. Where's that energy gonna come from? Um, and so if you have peak oil, that means the supply is fixed. Uh, if the supply is fixed and the demand keeps increasing, by classical economic theory, what happens? The price of oil goes up. 
as the price goes up, fewer and fewer people can use it and they can use less and less of it. So over time, it means the average per capita available energy is going down. And when it goes down, that means that I think there's gonna be a retrenchment in the economy. So we're, we're looking at two to 3% positive growth just to keep things even. And now we're talking about actually having 5% less energy per year, which means the economy will be shrinking at a rate of 5% per year. Uh, so the community solution. The reason that you, you can't do it yourself, I think the, the, the problem with the survivalist mode is that uh, there's not enough security, there's not enough skills. Um, so I might be the best doctor in the world, but what happens if I get sick? I need somebody else in the community who has that set of skills. I need somebody who is the best beekeeper in the world. I might be able to keep bees, but I need one person who's the best beekeeper in the world and one person who's the best guy who can fix old, you know, broken down cars and trucks. And that's not something that you can probably do with a really small group. And in fact, what I propose is that originally the community size that you're shooting for ought to be between 75 and 125 people. And the reason I suggest that's the right number is because when you look at the Amish and the Hutterites and you look at people who live in traditional societies, you look at small military units, they're all in that neighborhood of size. And I think the reason is because that's the most efficient size for a group. So you don't need to have a bureaucracy when you only have 75 people because you can have daily interactions, face-to-face -face interactions with them, and you can actually have a group that works without very much bureaucracy, so it works efficiently. Uh, next. I've, I've developed this idea of sustainability circle communities. These are probably not new towns or something. These are communities that we knit together out of existing people in existing neighborhoods or groups of people on the internet who live within some geographically you know, feasible area to work with. Uh, and it's taking old buildings and super insulating them and creating new jobs uh, and doing these in these, these sustainability circle communities. Next. Uh, so <clears throat> the places that seem to be good are inner cities, uh, small towns in rural areas. Um, the, uh, I think originally these may need a patron, so somebody needs to get these started, but once you start building the communities, you'll actually have people there to actually do the work, so you need somebody to get them started. Um, and then because, you know, we have a lot of distressed properties, you know, it makes sense to maybe start building these communities because this is a good time to do it. Uh, so you need a nucleus of uh, people who are committed. Uh, you want to have uh, people that are, are willing to uh, revalue their contributions. So if everybody says, okay, well, I'm worth 40,000 a year, it's probably not gonna work. Uh, so essentially, if you say we need a sustainable economy, that means the people's interests have to flow together with the community's interests. So I think you need to look at the microeconomics of people's lives and then fit those into a community that basically, that basically gives more than it takes. Um, these are just some ideas for, uh, for the businesses that could help power some of these sustainable communities. Uh, so we have something like 80,000 vacant lots in the city of Chicago. Uh, they don't do anything except collect trash right now. Uh, they should all be turned into gardens or coppicing. Uh, coppicing is when you actually grow trees uh, for firewood. Uh, you grow them when they're three to 10 years old. You harvest them. Uh, that resets the tree's life and you can then do that on a 10-year, 7 to 10-year cycle. 
Um, the construction of masonry heaters, so masonry heaters are a very energy efficient way to actually utilize the wood that you're making in the coppicing yards. Uh, but somebody needs to learn how to design those and build those. Uh, you need uh, to utilize waste heat from places that you have it now. So for instance, uh, you have a laundromat here that needs hot water. Uh, you, have a, um, you have a cold storage facility over here or a Baskin Robin that's producing lots of heat from their refrigeration. You need to figure out how to share that energy. Uh, super insulation is insulating your house so that it's not just, you know, whatever they recommend at ComEd, but it's actually very, very well insulated. And then using insects as animal feed, composting, there's, I could talk all day about all the options, but there's lots of things that will be needed in the future that these, uh, these sustainability circle communities could start making. Uh, okay, so if you do a risk analysis of this, so you jump in and you say, great, I love the idea, let's do it. Um, so what are you risking? Okay, so, so what you're actually risking is the um, improbably small, uh, 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 the, the improbably small percentage option that you might become one of the 1%. So essentially, it's like going to Hollywood. Everybody's working as a waiter, but they could be the next, you know, the next big movie star. Uh, everybody's sort of in that situation. Most people are just barely making it, um, but the reason they keep doing it is because, you know, I mean, maybe the next thing that you do will make you fabulously successful. So you're giving that up if you do the sustainability circle communities, because I'm suggesting that we're gonna be sustainable, which means there isn't much profit in sustainability. So you have to be sustainable economically, which means everybody can't be taking everything out. Everybody's gonna be self-supporting. So if you think of an Amish community, um, they're not looking for anything from anybody else and they have a little bit extra to take care of everybody in their community. That's, that's about as sustainable as you're gonna get right now. Uh, and, and if, so, so that's if you're wrong, what'll happen is, well, you'll end up forfeiting the chance to be rich and famous, uh, but you'll have developed the relationships with people in your community uh, that will be, uh, that'll be a good thing. And then if I'm right, and the sustainability circle communities are one of the ways to thrive, then it may be absolutely crucial that you be part of one of the communities. And that's my final slide. <laughs> Next. So, thank you. So we're, we're going to entertain uh, questions and comments if, if anybody would like to jump up, yes? Um, in one of the two slides you presented, uh, you showed like in you know, 2008 there was this surprising bit before it yes. went back up. What uh, was that? Okay, so, so 2008 is when we had essentially the, the uh, foreclosures, so we had the, the economic crash based on all the bad paper that was out there. So economic activity decreased. And so you see that in the amount of carbon dioxide gets reduced. So the economy tanked for a year or two, but then uh, it started back up again and now it's almost producing as much CO2. So it's really a, it was really a function of the economy tanking. So if the economy goes down, we use less energy, we produce less things. Um, so that slows down the uh, rate at which we're producing carbon dioxide. Uh, well, I, I think they're actually, they're actually aligned with each other because what happens is that when the economy increases, the, the, uh, the ecology goes down. Um, and so, so there's going to be kind of a, a, a working our way down with, with this reduction in energy and stuff. Yes. <laughs> Having tried to work with small groups before, it's really kind of problematic and I'm wondering if you had 
any resources for setting up these sustainable communities or if you had any um, detailed information about that because it's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> well, I, I, I misspent about 10 years of my youth as a community organizer, so I can certainly sympathize with you. Uh, I can't say that we have, the, have a package ready that this is how you do it. Um, I think the people, that people are ready to do it. Um, and I think that uh, at least uh, conceptually, um, you can get the, the interests of the individuals aligned with the community. It works a lot better. Uh, we tend to think of uh, intentional communities as some place you escape to. Um, somehow you completely separate yourself from the economic, social life of the sort of the country. I don't see these, these uh, sustainable circle communities doing that, um, but it's, um, it's probably a discussion in some more detail. It's not all worked out, but I do have some ideas. It's just that uh, you didn't really want to be here for a three hour lecture. So. <laughs> But I'll be happy to talk to you later about it, and, and if there's more interest, I will make another presentation about that specifically. Yes? Regarding uh, your presentation focusing on CO2 concentration, uh, a lot of people who advocate for the increased use of natural gas point to its smaller production of uh, CO2 compared to coal. Um, However, it's just kind of coming into public consciousness that particularly with the fracking process, lots of unburned methane ends up going into the atmosphere and that the greenhouse effect of that unburned methane is many dozens of times more powerful, at least in the 20 year time frame, than CO2 is. So I just, uh, uh, and it's particularly at a time when uh, our state legislature is on at the cusp of approving a regulation bill that will allow fracking, um, I wanted to make sure that this audience is aware of that and uh, maybe, maybe we'll act accordingly in uh, calling their state senators and reps and urging them for the moratorium on fracking. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, in favor of, I'm in favor of doing all of those things, um, but I, I would like to warn you that I think that it's, the events are going to drive uh, the way people think and what they do. So it may have to get worse before it gets better. And so I think we're going to have regulation, <laughs> but I think that we're also going to have all of the evils that are, you know, come from that. Um, I'm also worried about things like GMOs because I think, you know, if you have a GMO that starts producing, you know, something in your body, uh, that's not something you can say, okay, well, let's take that back out of the system. It's like invasive species. You know, I mean, we haven't eradicated any of the invasive species. Uh, we just learn to live with them. But, uh, you know, if a GMO starts turning the carbon in your cells into, you know, carbon fibers or something, I, you know, that, that could be the end of us too. But I agree with your I, I agree with your sentiments. Yes.
Okay, so, so the reason I suggest that uh, you, you have uh, these communities of interest are because I think that the only uh, institution, the only, uh, the only people that can actually make a radical difference are individuals deciding to change their behavior. So I could decide not to eat any meat and I could never eat meat for the rest of my life. But I don't know of any group that I could make decide not to eat meat and then never have them eat meat for the rest of their life. So, so if you and I agree, at least we could agree to that and then maybe we could get 73 of our friends to agree to it and then we'd have a community that was actually able to make a difference. So, so I don't suggest that these communities withdraw, but I think they need to develop a new set of rules which eventually could be built into societies that are actually sustainable. Yes. So given all this uh, radical decentralization that you foresee, does that mean that uh, the economy would be more like a barter economy with your skills and resources? Uh, so I, I think that we'll be uh, reusing a lot of things. We'll be uh, deassembling them and using them. I think that there will be uh, less, uh, less reason to have currency because the currency is also an IOU from an institution that won't be as strong as it is now. So if you want to be self-reliant, that probably means you'll be doing less things with checks and more things with, you know, I have something of value that you need. So yes, I, I, I think that's probably correct. Anybody over here, sorry, yes? Um, that brings me to the question of waste and like, you seem more familiar than I am with the sort of mathematics of these predictions, but um, you know, the, like as far as I know, the amount of waste that we have in landfills right now is set to, you know, they're kept in these giant plastic bags, essentially, that are set to expire. And nobody has any any kind of a long-term plan about like what the hell do we do with all this toxic juice when it starts seeping out. Um, so, is there a sense of like how the what we've already accumulated will be worked into the long-term plan, either environmentally or, as you mentioned, in terms of material economy? I think it will. I think that even now there are some materials that are in higher concentrations in landfills than they are in mines. So in the future I think we'll be taking the landfills down and we'll, we'll be reprocessing uh, most of the material. Hopefully we'll do it before it all leaks into the groundwater and contaminates everything. But you know that's a, that's a wish not a prediction. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you're familiar with uh, a recent book by Jeremy Rifkin called The Third Industrial Revolution, which is in the bibliography of Al Gore's recent book on the future. And he, he's an advisor to the European Union and I think the government of Germany. And he has a kind of master plan to save the world, I would say, which involves a, um, a super smart grid of clean energy. I, I have to kind of oversimplify it. It's very complex, but <laughs> I was just wondering if you know about that book. And I, I think it also uh, connects with uh, Buckminster Fuller's concept of a uh, global energy network institute, which I think actually exists in at least in the way it is. <laughs> and uh, the concept of synergy, or uh, you might say uh, environmental economics, which is uh, even uh, Adam Smith said that his economics would not be work, not work after 200 years. And I'm just wondering, like, uh, people like Hazel Henderson or E.F. Schumacher talk about environmental economics where there's more synergy or cooperation. I know this might sound like a dream, but, but I think it's a dream worth pursuing. And also, there might be a uh, possibility of a world future channel, like Mr. Like Channel, where all of these things are discussed, you know, and people learn to uh, cooperate more and use some of the principles that he has seen on our particular and very very and also uh, 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 the book about uh, climate capitalism by Henry Lowe. All those ideas can now kind of be combined. And maybe there might be some hope if there can be a uh, transfer.
Okay, so, yeah, so, so, uh, so I have to tell you that the reason that I, that I prepared this lecture in the first place is because I have pretty much read almost everything on this subject. And what you see with every book is 200 pages of very detailed explanations of why everything is screwed up. And then the last 10 pages is, if I was God, this is what I would make happen in the world. And that's really the problem is that, okay, so if I was God, you know, I would do this. And if he was God, he would make a, you know, a, a, a smart grid that would cover the whole earth. But the problem is that our, that our political system is kind of stuck between the 45 yard lines and we, we're not going to, nobody's going to be able to push it to go that much in the direction that it needs to go. Which is why I say that I believe it's a good thing to lobby for you know, things that you want, uh, like you know, renewable energy, and to lobby against things like fracking and GMOs. But I'm, I'm an old civil rights guy and an old anti-war guy. And so I know that you know, it takes a lot of energy even to make small changes. And I don't think by the time those small changes happen, events are going to overtake them. And you know, the, it's, you know people do things because of uh, hope or because of fear, but mostly because of fear. So, so things are gonna have to get worse before they get better. Yes. 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 Oh, you made it up extremely abundantly clear that it's not a matter of more and, and unless people don't understand that in the, uh, the beginning, there is not more resources in the earth. We are eating up the earth alive. And people keep talking about fusion and, and this, it doesn't make any difference. If you find a, a plentiful, clean source of energy, we will eat the earth in, 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 in five years. It's not the solution. Right. So, so you, you, you made it very clear, but it still seems to be the same thing. Well, okay, so, so if, you watch, if you watch TV or you read, you know, magazines or newspapers, um, nobody is telling you that we're about to run out of iron ore and copper and, you know, they're not telling you, you know, anything except that, well, somebody's working on this great thing, whatever it is. And, and you know it's unclear whether it's 10 years or 50 years from commercialization and even things like wind which make perfect sense um, are still a very small fraction of the amount of energy we get and even though they can compete with fossil based fuels um, you know it'll be 50 years before there'll be enough committed resources to make them compete with fossil fuels so uh, so, so we just, we're going to have to change our lifestyle, and I don't think we're going to do it voluntarily. We're going to do it after there's a lot of pain. And so, so it's one thing if I tell you that we're running out of oil. It's another thing if you go to the gas station tomorrow and all of a sudden it's 10.39 a gallon instead of, you know, 4.39 a gallon. That's going to be the thing that's going to make the difference. So I'm not... You know, I think it's great for people to try to make these changes, but th that's not the backdrop in which most people are seeing this problem. Yes? I wondered if you could uh, recommend like 10 books on the survival, you know, strategic survival tactics that... Uh, so, so there's a book called Scarcity. Uh, the author's name is Clugston, C-L-U-G-S-T-O-N. Uh, pretty much covers all of the uh, non-renewable natural resources. Scarcity. Scarcity is the name of the book. Um, pretty much all of the Heinberg books, Richard Heinberg books. Uh, there's uh, uh, resilience, community resilience hand, uh, uh, handbook and cookbook by uh, uh, Alan Bates uh, that I would recommend. I think that's good. Uh, he's going to be at the Bioneers Conference. Uh, John Michael Greer has a lot of uh, interesting books. Uh, sorry, what was the one you were reading? 
Ecotechnic Future by John Michael Greer. He will also be, I believe, at the uh, Bioneers Conference. Uh, he has a lot of um, sort of theoretical underpinnings for, for how this works. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can talk to me afterwards and I could send you a more complete list, but I think that would give you a good start. Yes. On a couple of slides, you have the word security, even when we're in this quarter acre someplace. Mm -hmm. But it struck me as you were talking about the massive disruption that we also would expect massive violence mm -hmm. as you have the whole economic system collapsing. What's your thoughts? So, so, so I think that I think there's some some interconnection here between my ideas and the survivalists. I think that communities are going to have to be uh, concerned about security, um, but just like energy, just like providing clean water, these haven't traditionally been independent single family responsibilities. So, so as soon as you had any kind of small town on the prairie or out west, wherever you were at, uh, you got a sheriff, you, you got deputies, you, you, you developed a security structure. Uh, it wasn't one person with a gun. I mean, that, that tends to make more chaos than it does order. So, so I think that there will be um, a lot of dislocations, and I think that will lead to crime and, you know, all the things that, you know, social dislocations lead to. And I think communities will have to uh, will have to be able to protect themselves. So I think there's a security issue that's going to be involved. So, you know, I'm 60 years old. You know, I'm not going to go outrun somebody. Uh, you know, uh, if they're chasing me. But you know, so I'm going to have to depend on some other bigger system uh, to be secure. And if you have crops in the field, uh, they have to be secured. Because if people are hungry, they'll come and get them, and they'll come get them in the middle of the night when everybody's sleeping. So yeah, I think that's it's an issue, and I think it's something that communities will have to address, not individuals. Does that? I think it. I think it's a. I think it's a problem that that people will actually have to address, and I don't think they'll be addressing it as individuals. I think they'll be addressing it as a community, just the way they do now. Anybody else? <laughs> yes. Um, there's a great essay by Joanna Macy called The Great Turning. Uh, it's an eco-literacy essay that has, I wouldn't call it an optimistic bent, but it's a more positive perspective um, on the state of our economy, the state of our societies and the state of the earth. Um, again, the title is The Great Turning. And it postulates that there are, I'm sorry, it postulates that right now, uh, the present day today will be written in history as a time when many people were changing their perspectives, many people were changing their lifestyles. <coughs> Excuse me but that things were beginning to creep and crawl now. Um, and that there are three major ways in which people are participating in the Great Turning. Real quick, the first um, would be often through protests or through the internet or through word of mouth on the underpinnings of the, as she terms it, hegemonic corporate state. That is a society in which we all participate um, in pushing, and we all, through our lives and interactions, we are participating in a system that is damaging the earth and being unjust to people. So that's the first point. Protest is a great example of how to participate in this point. Uh, the second is in creating an alternative. I think what um, Professor Blake Davis mentioned here today in terms of community circles. This is an alternative um, to the way that people live today. Other alternatives include watershed restoration um, and include different methods of farming, etc. 
but things like collaboratives are an alternative instead of everyone having their own house, buying all their own stuff, collectives, etc. And the final point really is the evolution of consciousness. That is, as we come to think about what's taking place, come to think about uh, deep ecology, this idea that traditional knowledge is going to become more and more important, um, that, that slips into sort of the survival perspective. Um, but also things like Buddhism and world compassion um, and empathy for others. So check it out. It's, uh, it's pretty upbeat. Joanna Macy's The Great Turning. I can also, I, I can also recommend that. Um, and, and, I, and I would like to say if, if anybody feels like I'm being um, too depressing, I'm not trying to be depressing, but I am trying to, to give you a reality check because I think that we think that somehow magically more resources are going to appear so that we're not, uh, we're not uncomfortable. And <laughs> those don't necessarily happen because we're uncomfortable resources appear. So. Well, I, I heard that all the rich people were going to Mars and recreating a society like ours, but with fewer people, so that would, there would be enough resources. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to mention that I know we're in the church, but for those who believe in reincarnation and karma, they have a reason to think about the far future, <laughs> even beyond their individual lives. And if you do believe in that, then you might as well start now prepared for the part of the dream because you might have to do that. <laughs> yes. Yes, go ahead. Is your presentation available uh, online? Some people uh, can share for the people. Pam and Land, you said that it will be available? Uh, yeah, well, this will be available by Ken TV. And uh, we will post the, the, the resource, and it will be available online as well. If you go to the Bioneers website and watch for that, you'll be able to get access. Is that looking online where I can actually share it with yes. other people? Yes, we'll have a link to that, yes. Yeah, I would just like to add that as, as you consider the kinds of skills and social situations that we'll be likely to uh, be living into, uh, what I see from my travels over the last decade to Colombia, particularly the rural areas, is that they're living in advance similar situations to those that we will be facing. And while at first might come to mind, they're hungry, I'm hungry, they're going to be going after my food, it's, at least in that situation, more a question of the, the dominant structures that are there claiming the land for mega projects, mining, etc., versus people needing that land for food production. That's where the, the rub gets there, and I'm, I'm wondering if maybe it's going to look like that here too, and we can learn something from them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so one of the big uh, problems with redeveloping land in the city for farming has been that it's uh, most of the land is now owned by the city because of tax, you know, not taxes not being paid. And it's hard for the city to figure out how to equitably distribute that land back to people who actually need to use it. So it's been, you know, 20 years we've been talking about, well, it'd be a great thing to grow things on these vacant lots. But still, you know, most of them are still vacant and most of them have still not been given to the people who could actually do something with them. All right, are we good? Thank you very much.